Just in case you needed a reminder, we are in the hospitality industry. And if we give great hospitality, we get great reviews, we get return guests, and that means more money in your pocket. That's exactly what Will Slickers is teaching us right here on the Fearless Investor Podcast. Hey, everyone, welcome into the Fearless Investor Podcast. You are listening to me, Kyle Stanley, and I'm excited to talk to a good friend of mine and someone that I consider more like a brother now at this point, Will Slickers today. Uh, he is the host of the Hospitality FM. Uh, it's not just a podcast, it's an entire network. You're going to learn more about that here towards the end of our interview. But also, before we get started in talking about how to tap into your hospitality skills to make more money, I want to talk about how to tap into your technology skills to make more money, which is on the side of Price Labs. And good news, you don't have to be a technology whiz to make Price Labs work. Price Labs is an amazing tool that you can add to your calendar right now that will help you to get more bookings, higher rates, and fill in those vacancies with way less work. I'm telling you, before I was using Price Labs, I was putting in about 30 minutes a day to my calendar. Now I put in about 30 minutes a week and I make about an extra 15 to 20% of revenue. It's all because it's maximizing my pricing. It's taking supply and demand, calculating it in its own little algorithm, and it spits out prices just for you that make the most sense for your market and based on your type of property. So how do you get started with Price Labs? All you got to do is go to fearlesskyle.com forward slash Price Labs, and you can get your free 30-day trial started. And guess what? Because you sign up with that link, you get an onboarding training from Price Labs. It's going to teach you how to be able to get started so that it's fluid, it's easy, and you don't have a ton of questions on the front end because it could be confusing if you do not have that help. Now let's get to it with Will, Slick, Will Slickers, excuse me, the host of Hospitality FM. And honestly, one of the best brains when it comes to helping you with getting your guests the best experience and even increasing that revenue a little bit with some in-stay revenue. Hey guys, welcome into our live interview with uh, Will Slickers. He's from Hospitality FM, which I'm really excited to talk to you more about, and also recreation, vacation, rentals. Um, Will and I have actually become good friends because we met each other at the SCR Wealth Conference in Nashville. We knew about each other, but yeah. meeting each other and uh, exchanging a few hell yeahs, and before you know it, we're like brothers. So, <laughs> uh, hell yeah. Hell yes. Uh, <laughs> excited to have you on today, man. Um, we're going to talk about a lot of things here in the next 30, 45 minutes. As you guys are on here, as you are listening in, Will's going to be talking about hospitality and how to be able to tap into those skills, hone those skills so that you can start making more money in your short-term rentals business. So get ready to post your questions. In fact, if you know of anything right off the top of your head, if you're like, I'm struggling with this in hospitality, let's start commenting right now on this Facebook page. And if you're watching the replay of this a couple weeks later, go ahead and just still comment on the YouTube uh, page and we can go ahead and get those questions answered too. But Will, Mr. Slickers, got to start it off with yes, what's, your, what's your craziest Airbnb short-term rental story? Been in this for a while, so I can't wait to hear this one. All right. Well, uh, craziest, I'll, I'll go with one that's normally not like the fluffy, happy, you know, feel good story that we got plenty of those, but one of my favorite ones is when uh, my parents, so they were actually our first like hosting client that we took on okay. when I got exposed into the industry. And I came from a hotel, so I I had like that sixth sense when a, a party was about to had to happen. Um, we had plenty of guests that you could tell right away when they're checking in, you're like, oh, this is going to be fun. Um, and getting into the short-term rental side, it's harder because you're not checking them in in person. So right. you're like trusting that their profile is, is what they are. And I told my parents one day, they were looking at this uh, message from a guest and I was like, I wouldn't take this reservation. It sounds like a bachelor party that's being covered up with a golf, uh, golfing event for, right. for all these bros to come and have some fun. And they're like, Oh no, it's great. We're right next to a golf course. It makes total sense. Like, yeah, but there's some red flags I'm seeing. Uh, on their like communication and everything. Well, they were like, no, we're going to accept it without your approval. So I was like, okay, well then just FYI, when they party and damage, you know, whatever, um, it's on you. I'm not, I'm not doing anything. Like you're going to go clean it. You're going to go like, we're not doing it. Yeah. And they're like, okay, fine, whatever. Uh, so long story short, guests check out. I was the first one to run over to the property before the housekeeper even got there 
just to be like, I got you. I proved you wrong. And I was shocked oh, because pretty much it was like, cause I was right. But what, like the amount of glitter and like sex condoms and like, not just condoms, but like sex toys and handcuffs and blood on the pillows and the, the like oh. just everything was like, they had probably a blast in their mind, but the amount of alcohol bottles were there. Uh, it was disgusting. Let's just say that. So um, it looked like, uh, you know, uh, what's the company Playboy? It looked like a Playboy event that just happened. And uh, it looked like the hotel room after hangover that first night. Pretty, pretty much like we had lit, like the carpets were the worst. Like the, it was all hardwood floor, but the area rugs were just covered in like it literally looked like someone just dumped a bottle of glitter in one spot and just spread it around. Um, it took forever to clean. It was disgusting. Uh, it smelled weird. There was cake, you know, smeared on the walls. It was, it was bad. So that was my crazy first Airbnb experience with like, I think we were only hosting their property for like a month. And I told them like red flag, I was like immediate. And a month in we had our first party. Uh, so that was, that was exciting. <laughs> we got to experience those at some point. So uh, yeah. man, but you got a good lesson there too. Just follow your gut. You, uh, 100%. you wanted to follow your gut. Parents said no. And, and so you got to tell your parents, unfortunately, told you so. But, uh, well, let's let's get into this, man. We're, I'm really excited for people to, to get to know more about Hospitality FM here in a second and what you are mm-hmm. doing, what your mission is with that. But you have a uh, an extensive background in hospitality, in the hotel industry, short-term rentals as well um, at the ripe age of your, what, 27? Yeah, I'm 27 years old. Yeah, so. and so you, you've been, even though you're still young, you have a lot of experience and a lot of things to share. So just back it up really quick, kind of take us into what led you into this industry. What were you doing before you started jumping into the hospitality industry? 100%. Well, I kind of coincidentally got just brought into um, Harley Davidson through a friend of mine he was kind of running a food truck on one of their lots and they're like, Hey, we need help. And he called me. So we were just running this food truck and the owner was actually in town and stopped by. I just really loved the interaction and energy that we brought. So he was like, Hey, we want you to become our events manager and marketing director. I was like, Holy crap. Like that's, I have no experience in this, uh, but okay. So I, I said, yes. And I was making more money than I ever thought I would at, I think I was like 20. 21 almost. Um, so I was like, I love this it was great. And, um, after enough time, I just wasn't passionate about like Harley Davidson. I wasn't like, you know, the events were fun, but I didn't, I couldn't get with the brand fully, uh, to the extent that they wanted me to. So I uh, moved over to Spokane, Washington and was visiting some friends and just kind of doing a random day job, um, doing like heat thermostat inspections on the side of people's houses not exciting, not sexy, no idea how I like ran into that job, but, uh, it was, it was paying the bills and I was like, whatever, I don't care. But I just bought this like brand new, um, Mazda something. I forget if it was like a Mazda six or something, but a nicer car, car that I never really thought I could afford. And, uh, I was like, Oh, I'm going to do like chauffeuring. I want to like show for people at like events. And so I like bought all these suits and did all this, like, like pimping out of my ride, getting the water bottle set up, getting like some lights and creating business cards and doing the whole thing. And I formed this chauffeur and event company. So we actually started doing like weddings, um, corporate events, college uh, fraternity parties, like all this crazy stuff. And had like a small fleet of vehicles. And I had no idea what the hell I was doing. Uber became very popular. I had no idea how to control our expenses and all the legal fees that go in with having a chauffeur and licensed vehicle. So a year of opening it, I closed it and was kind of like going through like a array of depression after that. It was like, mm-hmm. I was doing all this fun stuff um, and just like couldn't get out of bed. But one of my friends was like, Hey, you should just get up, go apply at all these places that are like within a, a close distance of our apartment. And I just see what happens. And I was like thinking, you know, my first thought for the chauffeur company is I have this nice car. I should make it make money for me. And then I looked at my closet and I'm like, I have all these suits. I got to like put the suits to use, you know, I can't like let these suits just go to waste. 
And uh, so I went to this four diamond hotel where I picked up some clients and I remember like seeing the ambiance in the lobby. And I was like, Oh, this is nice. Like it was fancy. It was a four diamond resort. So I applied and I got hired right up there on the spot. And uh, that was kind of like the starting of falling in love with hospitality. So you literally just had a nice car and had some suits and said, what industry does that work with? And and went for a hotel. <laughs> a nice hotel too. Like it was like, you know, everyone's like standing really tall and, I just got now the army national guard, like during that, um, standpoint, like I had a six year contract, but I just got out of, like basic training and was in like really good shape. And like, finally felt confident after, you know, not being the most, uh, probably buff or strong or attractive guy in high school. Um, and so I was like, ah, like these suits and like you, you get to be like proper and experiencing like this type of luxury that I never got to see before. So it was just really attractive. I was like, this is cool. And I like people, so I think I can do this. Um, and my uh, my manager, when he was interviewing me, he goes like, how are you with technology? And I was like, it'll take me a while to learn, um, but I'm not like super slow. I just need, need probably a little bit of grace, right? And uh, then he goes, how are you with people? And I was like, I love people. Like I have five sisters, a brother. I've always been like the class clown or you know, the person that never had like a social click. It was like, everyone was my friend. And he's like, great, because if you answer that opposite, uh, like you're you're great with tech, but bad with people, you wouldn't have gotten the job. I could teach you the tech, I can't teach you the people. Mm. And that was kind of like the the aha awakening moment for for me being like, hospitality is like the industry I've been looking for my whole life. I just never knew that there was a way I could apply this skill uh, for a career. So that's yeah. awesome. So what what was this exact uh, role with the hotel? Yeah, so I was a front desk agent and I did that for about six months and I got quickly promoted to a supervisor. Um, so I was overseeing like a whole, not I wouldn't say a whole department, but a whole group of people um, from that from that standpoint. And it was a so, Marriott too. So uh, nice. So what yeah. did you start doing short term rentals while you were still there, or was that the next step after being in the hotel industry? Yeah, so that was actually after. So. Uh, 21 years old, moved to the Oregon coast because after two years of that, uh, being at that property, there was, it was 700 rooms, 60,000, uh, 717 rooms, but 60,000 square foot of event space. Like it was huge, big property to get mentored at a young age and like have the dedicated time to like learn and grow in that kind of environment was really rough, uh, just cause you're so busy all the time. Um, so I moved to the Oregon coast to get into an independent boutique property where I knew that, yeah, it'd be smaller door count. I probably can get some mentorship type, you know, um, experience. And so that's what I did and became a manager really quick. And then that's when my parents were like, Hey, we have this apartment that we just hate all of our long-term tenants. They trash the place. They don't pay rent. Uh, they have pets and the pets tear up the hardwood or whatever it might be. And we heard about this thing called Airbnb. Do you think you could help? And that's when the, like the light bulb moment turned on for me. It was like, this is like a one unit hotel. I just need to figure out how to do check-in without being there. And yeah. that's when I discovered like smart locks. And I was like, oh, when I discover smart locks, like this is game over. I'm solving all the problems that I had as a hotel manager through the one Airbnb uh, because you had the messaging on the platform, which you could automate and like create templates um, and then you have the smart lock, so you don't have to be physically there to give them a key. You don't have to worry about a key to be lost, all that stuff. So I was like, Airbnb, is the, that's it. And uh, um, as a hotel manager, I actually remember attending like a revenue management meetings and I discovered like AirDNA and all these other things. It's like getting like really heavily indated into the industry at that point. And for our, part, for our hotel, they're all condominium hotels. So like the units had full kitchens, full bathrooms, you know, all the amenities as if it was an apartment. Um, and then I realized we were in a heavy vacation rental market and that really changed the game on how we strategize our revenue and our inventory. And then I started a, a management company from there. Nice. And I, I want to get into that in just a little bit, but you, you're one of the rare ones that, you know, I feel like a lot of people they just have a house and so they want to try it on Airbnb, right? But you had the hotel experience and you were like, cool, now I can take the experience I had here and apply it towards, like you said, just a one unit 
uh, hotel basically, which is pretty yeah. cool like that. Um, my question for you is what is two parts? Let's start with this first one. What, what is like the biggest reason for you that you think so many people caught on to Airbnb and started liking Airbnb over hotels being that you're from the hotel industry? I think right. Uh, if we go before COVID, I think it was, it was something new and exciting. And, be, and honestly, even before COVID, it was way more affordable than a hotel most uh, could have been. When you look at what you're getting with a hotel, you're getting maybe 300 square feet versus a home. You can get up to like 1,600, 2,000, 2,500 square feet. You're not you know, limited to just being you and a, and a business partner or a significant other or whatever. You can actually have the comfortability of you know, home. Um, and back and back then, I remember Airbnb was way more affordable. You could you could get a home for you know one hundred nineteen dollars a night. The cleaning fees weren't outrageous. Um, the taxes and other fees weren't crazy. Um, and so it just became a really great way for people to save a little bit of money, but also have a better experience. Uh, the downfall I would say at that time, especially, was the lack of standardization. Right, so you never really knew what you're getting when it came to the home being clean linens, you know, amenities, ex, you know, all the other hotel stuff that, you know, you see at a courtyard, right? Like you're going to have three little mini shampoos. You're going to have enough toilet paper. The, the sheets are are clean. They're white. So you can see if there's any stains, hairs, et cetera. Um, short-term rentals were a little bit different, but uh, I think that's kind of like the preferred reasons, like affordability, the, the bigger space. Um, and of course, like being not confined to like a, 300 square foot box. Yeah. Okay, cool. I like that. And because those are the things that, you know, point out to me or stick out to me is, yeah, I, I thought of it that way as well. When I got a three bedroom house, I was like, cool, I can get this three bedroom house rented out for $150 a night, which works on the numbers in my market, which means I'm going to make, you know, an extra two and a half times my rent. But the bigger draw to me was, man, that hotel that's like you said, 300 square feet is the same $125, $150. And it can really only fit two people where my three bedroom can yeah. fit 10. So, yeah. okay. I love that. Uh, now, what's the things that you learned in the hotel industry that just either felt like second nature in, in Airbnb and maybe you like picked up your head and you're like, oh, this feels like second nature to me, but this is actually, this seems like it's something that a lot of other people are needing to learn or having a tough time learning. Um, or, or maybe even uh, same lines there, just what's the biggest things that you felt like you, you were able to just apply from that whole hotel industry into short-term rentals right away that made you successful? 100%. Um, right out the gate, it was, you know, I started off with Marriott and with Marriott, when, whether you're a housekeeper or maintenance person or even front desk, like you get like, probably books and books and books of the brand and how the standards are for the brand, what types of other brands are in that brand, like courtyard to residence to an autograph collection to this, to that. So you get in, like indoctrinated basically on what is Marriott. And so for me, when going through the hotel experience, everything standardized, you had a checklist for your housekeepers. You had the same amount of inventory from linen, to amenities, to what was, you know, displayed at the lobby, how did a room look, whether it was a studio or a two bedroom or a one bedroom, like that standardization was there. Uh, check-in was four o'clock, check-out was 11, there was structure. And so when my parents were like, hey, we have this long-term rental, we want to turn to an Airbnb, how do we do this? Okay, great. What time do you want check-in to be? Three o'clock, great. Three o'clock, what time do you want check-out to be? Think about your turnover. This is a little bit bigger space in the hotel. So, you know, what would take 30 minutes for me to clean a studio um, at our hotel would take probably up to an hour, hour and a half, depending on, you know, your uh, your guests and how they leave the, prop, the, the place based on your bigger square footage. So give yourself like some leeway. Um, so they, they're like, all right, check-ins, three o'clock, check-outs, 10. Okay, mm -hmm. that was the standard. Get the smart lock. How do we make sure that this is safe? So... Like giving the same code to everybody, figuring out the software technology. I knew that I had to have a proper management software instead of just depending on Airbnb because I knew Airbnb was a channel. So like I already had that knowledge of what does that back end tech stack look like um, instead of just listing on Airbnb and then realizing I needed to connect 
something like a property management software to go on Verbo and to do this and to do that. Uh, so all that came into first nature. Um, so then I was like, all right, well, other Airbnbs I've stayed at, the linen doesn't match. Every bed's different. The photos are a little crazy. It looks like someone did it with their cell phone. So I was like, let's get a professional photographer. Let's do this right. And that was kind of like the, the natural uh, course. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I like that you said the standard systems and processes and the setup. One thing that I think, especially as we go on today and start to see all of these, uh, you know, a lot of people are talking about bookings being down, occupancy being down. I think a lot of the reasons for that is because people kind of just took a copy and paste method mm-hmm. and just said, okay, cool, a bed in this room, a couch in this room, a piece of art here, and didn't make it unique, didn't make it different. And I think that is what we're seeing today is what is really becoming the difference is that people don't just want to stay at an Airbnb just for affordability and for space, but also the experience and how unique it would be compared to a hotel. So did you find yourself also kind of battling with that a little bit of like, okay, we've got some standards, but we also need to be a little bit different as well for our guests compared to a hotel? A hundred percent. So like my, I've been saying this for a while is that hotels are great for their utility for this. Like when we were in Nashville together, uh, great, great utility to be just at a hotel to drop my bags to sleep and to pretty much get ready for the next day. That's all I really needed it for. I didn't need to host people and to cook and to do all this stuff. Um, so when it came to the actual, like, when it came to the the overall experience of applying this over, it was really like, I'm trying to figure out the word. What would you say? It's like, oh man, I'm having a total brain fart here. It's You're not good, normal. man. Uh, shoot. Ask the question one more time. Sorry. Yeah. I know the word. It's, it's in, it's in the question. Good. I just, yeah, sorry. No, no. Yeah. We were just, I mean, all I was really saying is that we just have to, the, the biggest thing to me is that guests are showing more than ever that they need the experience over just yeah. the, you know, the, the cost of, of uh, the place and the extra space. hundred percent. Sorry. Now I remember where my thought yeah. was going. So <laughs> I always say like hotels were good for the utility, but the one thing that they've always failed to do and to focus on is the five feet or the five blocks around them, right? So like you have a Marriott brand and there's nothing of the local city or the local culture in that building ever. Mm, It's always the same artwork, the same coffee bar, which is usually Starbucks. Like, you know, that was always the missing piece. So with vacation rentals, especially when I first got started, I, we started this property in my hometown. So like I knew the best beach access. I knew the best coffee shop that was local, um, the great breweries to go to, the great restaurants. Like that became the fun part because we were able to pretty much create a unique, un un Googleified like version of here's our city, here's the experience that you can have when you stay with us because we already had those relationships. So like one of my first things that um, we did as an experiment was at the hotel. We had like packages, like a romance package, um, a sleep in package, a sip and stay package, whatever that might look like. And so for me, I was like, we can make some extra money outside of the nightly rate if we partner with these businesses that we go to on a daily or weekly or monthly basis, right? Like I know Joe from the coffee roasters. So I'm going to go to Joe, say, hey, instead of putting Keurig pods in our in our Airbnb, can we get some of the local roasted coffee? Um, and We did that and all of our guests loved it because it was super good. Like, obviously we were going to put crappy coffee in our, in our unit, but it's great coffee roastery. I personally drank the coffee and we got to highlight the story of them, right? Like they're a local family from Camino Island. The the coffee roaster has farms all over the world. Uh, You got to like bring this like richness to it. Um, And again, from like a hospitality standpoint, this is where I loved like, yeah, I can set up systems and standards and tech, that's great. That helps. But I want that to free up the time so that way I can focus on, hey, what are my local businesses around me doing? How can I promote them? How can I make my guests feel special and welcomed and not just like a heads in bed situation? That's that's really good. And I want to ask that to our audience that's listening in right now. So if you're watching this comment right now, uh, what are some things that you either 
are doing or are going to do that are going to make your experience a little bit unique compared to just that typical either hotel or that cut and paste Airbnb where there's nothing about the city, nothing about the experience. I want to know what you guys are doing. I see you, Rhoda and Dan and Brooke and Amanda. If you're listening right now. I want to hear some of your comments on that too. And let's let's get some questions ready for Will uh, because we're going to get into the, the meat of this right now. So you obviously uh, have been doing this for a little bit of time. Uh, and what we have this title today is, you know, how to tap into your hospitality skills in order to make more money. So what are some things that we have not talked about thus far that I th- that you think is really important for our audience to really capture and to not just, you know, honestly, I, I know a lot of it too is about making more money, but the only way we really make more money is if we truly create a great experience for our guests. So I guess the foundation really is how can we create that great experience beyond even what we just talked about? hundred percent. And I think it's really like the low hanging fruit to start, right? Like getting, getting the best like local businesses in your area to become a partner. And I know the word partner sounds like really like straightforward and strict, but like you literally can just go to them and like, Hey, we run a couple of these properties. A lot of our guests ask us the best place to go. We send them your way. Is there anything we can do to like make it really special for them? Can we give them a a 10% discount, like coupon or digital card or whatever it might be? Um, simple conversations like that open up so many doors. Mm. The amount of yeses we got versus no's was actually incredible. No, normally you hear no all over the, all over the place. Um, so like low hanging fruit and like right now it's no longer, I, I, and I'm surprised that you're kind of hearing the lack of reservations, right? Like booking and occupancies down. I think like right now the problem isn't bookings, right? It's like, it's getting more inventory. And then also, how do you capitalize outside the nightly rate? So what can you do for the in-stay that really generates some revenue for you? And that's where it's like, that's that's the new thing I want. Like as a brand, I think people need to be worried about is it's not just nightly rates anymore. It's it's really about how can you capture that in-stay revenue generating to then, again, more direct bookings in the future um, and creating like a loyalty you know base for a group of people that stay at your properties. Um, so my, my general stand like statement for hospitality is focus on really good communication. How do you like, what's the biggest thing that they teach you in hospitality school or Marriott is that you have to anticipate the guest needs. Mm -hmm. So get all of your stuff, like any questions that you think anyone can ask about the property, about the area, get it into an organized space, whether it's a digital guidebook, a PDF, whatever you want to use. Um, and have that ready because then you can be like, Hey, before you stay, here's some stuff you should know about the property. Granted, does everyone read it? No, but at least you put it out there before they start asking you and blowing up your phone. Um, that's kind of like an also easy first step. And then my next one, I think like blessing and a curse from Marriott is that like verbiage, right? How do you communicate with people, whether they are from a different culture, whether they're older, they're younger any type of background experience, you know, you name it, being able to communicate properly, no matter what, and like just using proper verbiage and being clear and precise and not having to like use bigger words or words that could easily be a workaround of uh, of kind of an avoidance of, of tackling something. So that's also another really easy thing is just making sure your verbiage and your messaging um, is proper. It's polite. It's uplifting, but then it's not, uh, redirecting people into a confusion um, based around like what they're asking. Yeah. I, I think that's so good. And and really just the, the idea behind that is how to relate to your guests. Right. And how to even um, one of the things that comes to mind for me is just being proactive with our guests, even beyond just their stay. So when someone says I'm coming into town to go to the wineries or to go to Yosemite, mm-hmm. like that's kind of a big thing here in Colorado, we're always encouraging our team. Hey, can you look up something that will help to, take away that need for research for them. Right. Um, one time we actually had a guest that said, Hey, we were on our way to the place Our, you know, we just got a flat tire. Uh, so we're about five minutes away and we're going to check in a little bit later. And so our team sent them, Hey, you know, just in case, you know, you don't have AAA, here's the closest auto shop. So, and here's their phone number. Like, even if they don't use that, it's just like, Oh, cool. Like you just went above and beyond to like help us. And that doesn't even have to do with anything inside of the, the house itself. Um, 100%. 
just a couple comments here. I love these. So we asked everyone what they're doing in their Airbnbs or what they're going to be doing. Brooke says, I'm going to add local coffee like you will and robes with my logo on it. I like that. Kelly's is really cool. Welcome basket of s'mores at our lakeside house with a fire pit. That's, I like that. That's nice. I like yeah. That. Good touch. Yeah. Um, then we've got, we've actually got a question here um, from Kevin that I think is really going to relate to, especially your, your coffee idea there. Uh, what is, do you have an agreement with these local vendors um, and is, does it add to your bottom line or is it just more about the experience for the guests? Um, so for a lot of these vendors, you don't really need an agreement. It's just kind of getting that communication, you know, straightforward because at the end of the day, you're referring them business and they're just giving you what they normally would probably give to anybody on Facebook or Instagram, right? Like 10% off isn't like an exclusive discount that only you are getting, right? Like I'm sure they give a lot of people 10% off. So it's just like communicating that and finding a way to make it really easy for them to realize, Hey, this referral was from Kyle. Um, all right. I know this 10% off is legit. It's not like someone creating a, a 10% off coupon or something off of their computer. Um, so a lot of them, you don't really need agreement. It's just really structuring it. So that makes it really easy for you and really easy for them. So my, my thing is like, if you could get on a platform that's very digital, like if you have a digital guidebook or if you, um, I think the host co was a company that was at, um, Nashville, like just creating like a virtual type store or type of marketplace really helps because it will streamline it. It's less work. It's really automated. Um, but then, yeah, I do, I do say it does add to the bottom line, um, because right now those costs of goods are pretty much zero on your end. So any extra money, right. is extra money. And you don't have to split this with the owner. If you're doing co-hosting, um, it's not like you have to, you know, take your 20% or your 25% out. That's a hundred percent of your revenue. So why not try to do as much as possible to create that in-stay revenue. So that way your, uh, your company is benefiting from, from it. So just, just to, and we don't have to go deep into this, but is the idea behind this implementation that you have this agreement with, you know, call it the local coffee shop, they give you a, you know, will refer to us 10% discount. And then they just collect however many dis, you know, of those coupons that come in their doors that month and send you a little bit of a percentage as well. Is that essentially the idea? The idea? Yeah. If, if we don't actually ask them for a kickback because okay. uh, for like, for like the coffee thing, like if we're getting 10% off, they're not going to give us 10%, but the guest experience is really good. But if we were going to do like, Hey, we're going to do a sip and stay package, right. Where it's a sellable package. All right. Then I'm going to go to the uh, brewery and I'm going to ask them for their best cider and their best, like maybe not a hazy IPA because a lot of people sometimes don't like IPAs. So like, let's say a Pilsner, right? Like grab the best two, create like a sip and stay package, get one of their branded glasses at like a lower cost. And then you take that cost for that package, you mark it up 25, 30%, and boom, that now is your revenue. You buy it at a lower wholesale rate and you can sell it for a little bit more. Cool. I, I like it. I like it, man. All right. That makes sense. Uh, Amanda also added in that they do weighted blankets. They call it the grab and hug and people love it. So <laughs> it's, I like it. Taking <laughs> cool. something simple and adding a unique twist to it. All right, let's get to some questions here. Keep your questions coming in. We've got a little bit of time left here with Will. Brooke asks um, two questions. I want to see which one. Let's, let's ask this first one. Uh, what amenities do you feel are the best that you have added into your Airbnbs? Just maybe something simple that kind of works across the board. Yeah, I would say if you can do like anything mobility wise, so depending on like your destination, it might be hard to do this, but one of my favorite ones is like electric scooters, or even if like we have a, one of our properties and it's like a gated community. So it's very like very quiet. There's nothing crazy, but we just put like a golf cart into the garage and people can rent it uh, through our digital guidebook. It, we you know charge them a per day fee. If they just want to use it for a couple of hours, then there's an option to do that. But like it turns off, we actually have a, a modem inside the golf cart that has that clock. So they do it a whole day. They have it for the day. If they don't, then it gets uh, it's a governor. That's what it's called. The governor will turn it off and it will make sure that they can't use it. So um, we do that one. And it's really fun because like in that gated community, there's like, you know, there's a kid's playground and park a few blocks away. There's uh, a nice lake where you actually do a little bit of fishing. 
there's a few little things that you can get to, but they're not all walking distance, uh, at least like if you have grandma in town or whatever. So we just had the golf cart. And for us, that was a really great amenity because um, we, I think the owner bought it all the way out. Like, I think it was like 2,500 bucks, bought the thing, put it in there, got it all set up with all the bells and whistles, uh, making it comfortable with like um, cup holders and a few other things. And yeah, now we just collect all the revenue from that because awesome. the owner was just like wanting a good experience and wanting good reviews. And so like, that's one of our number ones that we get used. Nice. And just in case you guys don't know, there are options that you don't have to actually own these uh, items. You know, if you're looking at doing like a bird or a scooter experience or a golf cart uh, and you don't want to take on the liability or the, uh, the ownership side of it, uh, Will, you're probably familiar with it, Mount. Um, yep, hundred so percent. I was just, just gonna, drop that in the I, comments. Rentmount.com. Um, yep. That's something that we're actually looking to implement in Arizona. We've been trying to do that for a while, to be honest, and just haven't pulled the the trigger. Maybe this is exactly the the motivation we needed. Uh, that's uh, that's the driver. I told I told the owner for our Florida property is like buy this golf cart because uh, at the time I don't think Mount was doing the golf carts, but we could still put it on the platform. And so it's like, hey go buy it. They bought it and we put it on Mount and that's, uh, we added the governor, uh, for, for the, like our case, uh, use, but the, the day rates, like everyone just does day rate. I think we, out of 10, we get one person that does like a couple of hours, but, um, yeah, it's, yeah. it's easy money, really easy. Kelly has a really good question here. I'm interested in your response on this because I have not done this. If you don't have any experience, if you don't want to answer this, that's fine too. Uh, she says, any tips on how to manage a pontoon boat rental as an add-on amenity? Um, it's pretty difficult to do off-site. Can you point me at least in a good direction is what she's asking. Yeah, uh, I would just point right back to Mount. Honestly, Mount's becoming a platform that you can take any of your extras and put it on there. You could have a private chef. You could do this. Um, I would talk to them about the insurance and like the coverage and liability stuff. Um, but outside of that, if you already have that, put it on there, make it a, a rentable add on experience. You can put parameters around it. Like, Hey, 48 hours before you arrive, this needs to be booked. If you don't book it during that window or before that window, then unfortunately, you know, we don't have the staff to, to, to pilot the boat. I don't know if that's the word pilot, but, um, yeah, I would just refer to that program because it's honestly like the one that we become more and more reliant on were like those in-stay experiences. That's awesome. I, I did not even realize that that they're getting that broad. So that's really good to know. Yeah. It's like, you don't need to own anything. You could have a, like I said, the private chef one is a big popular thing. You, you know, a great chef or maybe you yourself, yourself as a local host, uh, love to cook and love to host. So add that to the, the wheelhouse of tools and, upsells and people book that all the time. So that's a, it's always an easy platform. Make awesome. it easy as possible. Awesome. Uh, so aside from any, you know, add-ons that are physical products, do you have any other ways you keep mentioning this in-stay revenue? Is there any other ways that are able to do that, that we don't have to necessarily go and get a physical product that you have implemented into your hospitality? It's kind of a hybrid, uh, option. I, in the beginning of COVID, we had a bunch of guests still stay, even though we had a ton of cancellations. We had a couple that come came through for the reason of like quarantining or just like, hey, me and my wife are sick and tired of being in our apartment in downtown Seattle. Like we just want to get out and go to be like in a quiet place with like trees and real life around it where we don't have to like worry about people. Um, so that one was really the opportunity when I was like, okay, we can't we're not getting a lot of revenue. Like we're not getting a lot of guests at that point. It was like early COVID days. I think it was like April of 2020. So it was like maybe one or two people stayed and we had those packages in play. But the one thing was, was like, all right, if I'm going to do an experience and I can't leave this Airbnb, right. Other than to maybe go walk around the grounds of the, the neighborhood because it's quiet, it's outdoors. It's, you know, um, what do you call it? Uh, social distance. Um, the one thing that we realized is that, okay, we still have these packages available. So like, let's do a dinner night, but this was kind of like a, the risk on our part is like, I went to the local chef, the, the catering company that we partnered with because they gave us like this recipe book of possible, like in stay dinners to cook at home. And I was like, Hey, can you, can we film you making this dinner? I want to just use my iPhone said, can we film you making this dinner? 
off the recipe that you've given us and we're going to use this as like a romance package for anyone who stays with us. So wow. people would stay. We had this video edited. It wasn't like a, a high value, like Hollywood produced video, but just like did a little voiceover, did the chopping of the video step by step on this recipe and then said, hey, if you book this during your stay, um, you can have like that virtual chef experience. We actually had like the chef kind of like walking through. We did some edits. Like it was very custom. Um, so we did have to have obviously that the the recipe and like ingredients, but a lot of it was like super, super easy to go get at your, at your local grocery store. Nice. So um, after we sold it, like after the cost of goods, we were making so much more money because of that video, that, that, that private chef virtual experience. Um, so it was definitely a hybrid model, but that was one that was a lot of fun. We did a couple other options, um, different like menu items, do like a picnic basket, like go, cause the property was on five acres. So we, we had like a blanket and a basket and wine glasses and all that other stuff there. So we just did like a whole charcuterie board, like virtual experience and how to set it up properly. And, great picture ideas that you could do for Instagram. Like we just did a bunch of little things like that, hybriding the, you know, the physical uh, goods with the, the virtual experience. That is awesome. That's really awesome. All right. We got time for a couple more questions as I just saw them come through. Um, first of all, Brooke said these add-ons can only be done with direct bookings, correct? No, Brooke, you can do these with any bookings, any bookings at all. As soon as you have that guest booked, you have, you own that guest basically, and you can do whatever you'd like with them um, within, within reason, obviously. <laughs> so yeah. um, Mayan, uh, I hope I'm saying your name right. She says, how quick are you to give reimbursement such as clean fee or discount um, when they complain about something? Wait until they ask for it. Um, seems like there's a lot of savvy guests out there and know how things uh, prompt us to offer discounts. So any, any ideas for that? Yeah, my, my number one statement is trust but verify. Yeah. So obviously you don't wanna call a guest a liar, but in the hotel world, we were able to go to the room and see that the bed wasn't made or that there was garbage left in the bathroom, something like that. With, you know, especially remote hosting, if you aren't in your destination, like having a good team on the ground that's available and is, you know, attention to detail oriented, helps a lot, but trust, but verify, say, I'm going to send somebody over if there's an issue. Um, or if it's something like, Hey, they're just letting, you know, like the light bulbs out in the bathroom. Great. Thank you for letting us know. There's no need to offer them a discount. That's a natural thing outside of your control. Uh, but if it was something inside your control, like a bad housekeeper that you didn't uh, inspect their work properly, and now that's on you, then yeah, I would say immediately jump to how can I fix this? Can I send somebody over right now? Are you about to head out? If you are, we'll get it taken care of. Guess what? Here's a great, like you can offer to buy a dinner. Like there's easy things you can do um, for these guests outside of discounting or refunds. Uh, but again, if if it is a big issue where let's say, I don't even, I don't even know what to use as, as an example, but if it is a big issue, just be human. I think your video yeah. the other day on a, uh, on on instagram uh, that i saw it's like just be human yeah understand like you aren't going to have the perfect experience for everybody um so give them some slack trust but verify make sure that's true have someone on the ground if you can and amen. or pictures you know work but yeah that's kind of my my philosophy amen treat them like humans all right will amazing stuff here talk about uh hospitality fm now people need to know about this Cool. Well, uh, outside of uh, me slacking on getting you your agreement. Uh, Sam, I, was, I was supposed to be a part of this like two years ago now at this point. Uh, I know. <laughs> two months. I, I two months. <laughs> we're, we're, we're growing through a growth phase, which is good, but it's also a lot. Um, so as uh, during this like time throughout my time, like being a hotel manager versus like starting Airbnb, I started a podcast out of boredom. I couldn't find the mentorship that I wanted like to the full extent, I was getting a little bit here and there when I moved over to the Oregon coast, but I still wanted to learn more. I'm not great at school. I actually hate school. Um, not that, not in the sense of like, you shouldn't go to school. I just hated it as a person. I just don't learn that way. And so I was getting really heavy into podcasting with Gary Vee and Tony Robbins, et cetera. Started my own podcast. Didn't think anything of it. 
wasn't saying I was going to be like the expert. I wanted to interview people for free to get that education myself. And that ended up turning into two years of doing it to then being able to quit my full-time hotel management job to pay my bills and make money off of. Um, so that happened in 2019, quit, COVID hit. And thankfully I was in the National Guard. So I had some money coming in from the COVID orders I was on. And then the podcast uh, picked up again because short-term rentals didn't die as hard as hotels did. Um, so either way, whether I was a hotel manager or a podcaster, I would have lost my job in COVID anyways. So I'm just glad I did it. And um, started realizing like through podcasting, like what a powerful medium it is. Hence why we create a podcast network. We had a bunch of podcasters wanting help that were all based on around the same things, production, interviews, you name it, distribution, growth, um, and monetization. And then we had a bunch of sponsors that wanted to be on my show. Unfortunately, I couldn't take them because I'm not Joe Rogan. I can't do 20 minute ad slots and uh, was like, let's just marry the two. And now uh, after launching in December of last year, we have 36 podcasts total. So uh, soon to be 30, seven with Kyle, but I just need to get my shit together and get the agreement over. So yeah, that's where we're, that's where we're at right now. You, you said it, not me. Um, and, and this, and this is all in the hospitality industry. Yeah. So anything short term rental, anything hotel, anything restaurant, anything coffee, our site has over 2,800 episodes on it. And you can literally search any topic, revenue management, housekeeping, operations, entrepreneurship, guest experience, you name it, it's there. So that's kind of what we wanted. I needed that when I was, you know, when it was 2018, I was young and hungry and trying to figure this shit out. So then now, okay, anybody who's getting started, who's a pro, who's not a pro, whatever level you're on should be able to find it there. It's becoming hopefully a hub. And maybe one day if I'm cool enough, you'll even have me on the uh, Slick Talk show. How about that? I, I was actually going to invite you. So I was going to say, you're more than welcome to join me. I would love to pick your brain because I'm not heavy on the real estate side. That's, I know my weakness uh, when it comes to the whole STR spaces. I want to learn how to own a property. I'm tired. Like co-hosting is great. It's a very low barrier to entry, but uh, you know, we all know that ownership is a, uh, is a, also a good, good level to evolve to. Absolutely, brother. I'm trying to, uh, to post the there we go finally went went in hospitality.fm that's the website to find all of this so i saw linda you just asked what's po the podcast called it's it's a network of podcasts over 30 different podcasts in the hospitality world i just posted that in the comments but it's super simple hospitality.fm and yes will we're going to get me on there too and and we're going to yes. have some fun uh, yes we are well any other way aside from hospitality.fm that you want people to connect with you uh, LinkedIn. I love LinkedIn. So if you are a LinkedIn user, go find me, Will with one L, Slickers. And that's where I live and breathe on a daily basis with content and engagement and community. Um, and then Instagram is second-ish. And then Facebook is like very last. Like I rarely check my Facebook. So uh, and that that must be where where the contract is at to get started with hospitality.fm. It's just it's just stuck somewhere in Facebook. It's, That's the problem. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Will Slickers, you're the man. I uh, appreciate our friendship. And I also appreciate you coming on and helping our audience to conquer the world of short-term rentals and hospitality. Show notes for this one, fearlesskyle.com forward slash hospitality FM. And that will allow you to go check, check out the uh, show notes. It'll help you to be able to get connected with Will. We're going to have that website, hospitality.fm on here so that you can go ahead and get into his network. And when I'm finally on there, you can see my podcast on there as well. So that's it today for the Fearless Investor Podcast. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time to help you conquer the world of Airbnb. Mm -hmm.